the recording. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. We are happy and proud to have with us today Arkady Pretechinsky. He did his PhD studies in Maastricht University where he is currently an associate professor. His areas of research are mainly the mathematical aspects of dynamic games, but he also has papers that are purely mathematical. Um, and Arkady, the stage is yours. Uh, Dali, thank you so much um, for the invitation. Um, I would like to start by uh, perhaps uh, by expressing my appreciation uh, to the organizers for this wonderful sequence of seminars. I've been enjoying the talks tremendously, both uh, junior and senior. Um, so thank you so much for for the awesome um, for the awesome work. Um, and I would like to thank all of you for coming today to, to this talk. Um, yeah, so um, the pure mathematics paper, uh, one of them that, that uh, we have is uh, joined with uh, Ville Sermala. So um, this work uh, is, is a joint work with Janusz, uh, whom you all know very well. And with uh, Ville Sarmala, who you might or might not know, um, Ville is a um, fractal uh, geometer who is also interested in the uh, interaction between geometry and uh, probability. And he is based in the wonderful city called Oulu in Finland. If you have a chance to visit it, do so. Okay, so. I'm talking about uh, perfect uh, information games. Um, what are these? Uh, well, perfect information games are uh, uh, games where the players move in a certain uh, sequence and all the moves that the players made in the past are observed um, by everyone. Okay, so this perfect information. And in fact, we'll be looking at two-player zero-sum games. Now, two-player zero-sum perfect information games. Now, this is the class of games that's been studied really a lot from all kinds of perspectives by descriptive sub-theorists, by game theorists, by economists, by computer scientists, logicians. Um, so um, this is a very well-researched area. What we would like to bring in is perhaps a new perspective, a new viewpoint on such uh, games. What we would like to offer is a probabilistic approach to perfect information games. Now, what do I mean by a probabilistic approach to perfect information games? Well, this approach roughly amounts to the following. We come up with a certain set of games. All games in our set uh, are two players, zero sum games of perfect information. And we also come up with a certain probability measure on top of this set. And that makes, um, that makes for a measurable space of games, okay? And the world that we envisage is the one where nature chooses a game from our set. Uh, and the, the, this choice is governed by the probability measure that we have on, on this space. Okay, So nature chooses a game. And once the game is chosen, it's given to the players who inspect it, who study it, and who think about how they are going to play this game, okay? Now, all games in our set um, happen to have a value. That's because all games that we consider have bounded upper uh, semi-continuous payoffs, and that guarantees that uh, there's a value. And under our approach, the, the value of the game is a random variable, right? Because the game is random, so the value of the game is a random variable. And our task as researchers is then to study the distribution of the value. 
And what does this mean? Well, we ask questions like uh, these, for example. What is the probability that player one has a winning strategy? Okay, so let me rephrase it a little bit. Some games in our set uh, have the property that player one has a winning strategy, others don't. So what is the measure of a set of games where player one has a winning strategy? Or another example of a question could be, uh, is the probability that the value is at least k positive? Okay. So these are examples of the questions we could ask in this setup. So very roughly, this is what the paper is going to be about. And I hope that uh, for the, you know, I'll, I'll try to elaborate on, on all these aspects. Um, but first, let me tell you about the existing literature. And uh, for our convenience, I split the literature into three broad branches. So let me start with the first branch. This is, of course, the literature on perfect information games, which is, uh, which is very massive and huge. So I selected the, the works that are the most relevant uh, to our research. Uh, in fact, uh, the first one on the list, uh, the one by Gale and Stewart, is very relevant. Uh, so uh, this is one of the first papers on um, infinite games with perfect information. And in that paper, um, considered are games with a closed winning set. And in fact, this is relevant because these are the type of games that we encompass in our setup. I mentioned Martin's Borel Determinacy, uh, even though we could do without, uh, because this is such a milestone. This is really a landmark result, and not just in game theory, really not in all of district set theory. Um, but the, this, uh, this paper is about games that go beyond uh, the, the scope of this paper. And I also uh, would like to mention uh, some works on, on games, uh, perfect information games with semi-continuous payoffs. There are quite a few with uh, zero sum or without zero sum, two player or n player games. Um, uh, these are relevant because all uh, games that we consider have semi-continuous uh, payoffs. Okay, so um, yeah, so as you can see, the, the, this is this is a very well researched area. Um, I mentioned to you that uh, the novelty of this paper is is that we bring in a probabilistic approach uh, to look at perfect information games, but uh, this statement should be qualified because the probabilistic approach by itself is certainly no novelty in game theory. Right, so we have uh, this branch of literature on random uh, one-shot games. Uh, this is also a very rich and mature and very interesting uh, area. Uh, typically, uh, one would consider in the simplest setup, uh, what you should imagine is a normal, that is a one-shot uh, one game, let's say a two-by-two two game with eight payoffs that are generated randomly from a certain probability distribution. And then one could ask questions like, is there a pure Nash equilibrium? What is the distribution of the number of Nash equilibria? What is the probability for the, say, best response dynamics to converge to a Nash equilibrium? Okay, You might still remember a, a wonderful talk by Marco a few, what was it, months ago? In, for the One World uh, uh, Seminar Series. Um, in fact, Marco was presenting his recent paper uh, on uh, random uh, one-shot games, which is now forthcoming in the MR. So this is the kind of literature I'm referring to here. However, all these are one-shot games, and we are doing extensive form games. So what about random extensive form games? Well. There isn't as much, but uh, there is uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, paper uh, by Ariely and Babichenko. They look at um, extensive form games of a fixed length. So their setup is going to be different from ours. Um, and they generate the payoffs randomly, and the payoffs are attached to the terminal nodes of the game tree. 
so our study is going to be complementary to theirs because as you will see the measure on 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 the set of gains that we consider is quite different even more closely related to our work are these papers and you will notice that they are not even published in game theory um, and really these are not game theorists um, some of these people are probability theorists working on percolation others are computer scientists and really there's some interest here in um, adversarial versions of the percolation of the classical percolation problem um, so our contribution to this literature is twofold, I could say, we really mix and uh, combine different elements of uh, different modeling techniques coming from different papers, resulting in a setup that is distinct from any, any of these. And in my opinion, somewhat more interesting for, for game theorists. In particular, um, we have a richer uh, set of payoff functions that we uh, allow for. Uh, in our setup. Okay, so this was my uh, review of the literature. Feel free to uh, interrupt me, by the way, at any point. I'm happy to take questions. And this is the plan for the rest of the talk. Um, so my ambition is to guide you through the two examples. And in fact, I'm going to spend quite some time on these two examples. Then I would like to explain to you how they fit into the general setup of the, um, of, the, of the model. And then I'll be talking about the main results of the paper, but in fact, uh, I might not spend a lot of time on the main results. Why? Uh, that's because these are technical results and the juice and the, uh, the, 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 the benefit of these main results uh, they become apparent when you look at the corollaries. So if time permits, I'd like to talk about some of the corollaries to the main results. Examples. Okay, example one. Okay, so I'm talking about random perfect information games. And in this example, in particular, the game tree is going to be random. And it's going to be generated or constructed through a branching process. And the way it works is like this. So we start with the initial node over here. It's called the root of the tree. And this root of the tree is going to have a number of children, n. And this number could, in principle, be 0. Um, and the probability for the root to have n children is, is this, 1 minus lambda times lambda in the power n. So for example, if I take lambda to be 0 0.9, uh, then uh, the root will have no children with probability of 10%, exactly one kid with the probability of 9%, uh, and so on. So let's see. OK, so the, the root turns uh, out to have three children. And then each of these children are going to have kids of, of their own. And the number of children for each of these nodes is drawn just from the same geometric uh, distribution, independently of each other and uh, independently of what happened before. Basically. Okay, so the first child of the root has two kids. The second child of the root, oops, okay, uh, that child doesn't have any uh, uh, children. So it's a childless node. And the third child of the root has three kids of his own. And so on. This process continues like this. And we construct a, a game tree. Okay, So this is going to be a game tree. What are we missing? Well, in, ga in this game tree, we're missing who is controlling which node. So we have two players, and only one player will be active at a given node. So we have to assign the nodes to the players. And this we also do randomly. So we assign a node to either player one or to player two. 
and the probability with which we assign a node to uh, player one is denoted by Q. And we do so independently across the nodes and also independently of the way the tree had been constructed before. So everything's independent. All the random variables I introduced uh, thus far are independent of each other in this example. The blue nodes are those assigned to player one and the red ones are assigned to player two. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so we have the game tree. We have the game tree and, uh, and now the players could play the game if only they knew what to do. So we're missing the payoff. Now the payoffs in this example are very simple. Basically, player one wants to play forever. Player one doesn't like stop playing. Player one wants to continue playing forever. And well, this being a zero sum game, player two wants to stop player one. That is to say that the payoff is one. If uh, the play never reaches an end node and the payoff is zero, if eventually an end node is reached, a childless node. All right, so uh, we have a game. This is this is a game, um, and um, just to emphasize this point uh, once again, once nature has constructed the game, uh, it's been inspected by the two players. All of its elements um, are visible, and uh, and and the players um, look at the entire realization of the play before they even start thinking about how to play it. So they're free to adjust their strategies to, to, to the game at hand. Now, the game has a value, which could be 0 or 1. Um, by the way, in uh, this uh, particular realization I have just presented to you, the value, you can see that the value is 0. Because um, if player 2 chooses child number three at this node and child number three at this node, then no matter what player one does, the uh, play eventually reaches an end node, right? So if player one goes up, uh, then yeah, you can see that if either he has to continue to, to an end node or he has to give turn to player two, but then player two terminates the game. And the same happens here. All right, so in, in this picture, the value is zero. But the question that we are asking is, what is the probability that the value is zero? Is it always zero, perhaps? Right? Or is there a positive probability that the value is one? Okay, so here's the answer. Okay, what do you see here? Well, on the Vertical axis, you see the thing we're interested in, the probability that the value is zero. That is to say the probability that player two has a, a winning strategy. And the horizontal axis is the so-called player one's activation probability. This is simply the probability with which player one is assigned to a node and it's denoted by Q. And the most obvious feature of this graph is that it's not increasing. And this, of course, is very intuitive. The higher the probability for, for player one uh, to be assigned uh, to a node, the more, node player one, the more nodes player one controls, uh, the easier it is for player one to play the game and the more likely it is that uh, player one has a winning strategy, right? So uh, it's really intuitive that um, this is a non-increasing uh, function. However, what I find interesting here is this number over here, 0 0.1021. Now, the reason I find this number interesting is, is that if player one's activation probability falls below uh, this partic particular threshold, then the probability for the value to be zero is one. The value is zero almost surely. 
So player two wins the game almost surely. Only if player one's activation probability is above this threshold, does player one have a chance of ever winning the game? Okay. So for this reason, we call this number critical activation probability, and we pay close attention to these cr critical activation probabilities in the paper. Mm. Okay. Sylvain. OK, if you have a question, just interrupt me. Okay. So, uh, Arkady, this is a I believe that I'm by, done actually. with. This uh, value. Marco? Yes, this value QC, I assume, is a function of lambda. Yeah, so lambda is fixed here at 0 0.9. And in fact, I'll show you the formula later on in the talk for QC as a function of lambda. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. OK, uh, this was example, um, example one. Uh, what's and now we can go to. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you please elaborate on the meaning of the probability of extinction of the game tree? Okay, um, so it is possible that the game tree is finite. If there are too many end nodes, the game tree could turn out to be finite. Now, if the game tree is finite, then of course, player two has a winning strategy, right? Because player two's objective is to end the game. And if the game tree is finite, then of course, player two automatically uh, wins and the value is zero. And uh, ex the extinction of the game is the probability theorists jargon, uh, the term for the game tree to be finite. And it happens that the probability of this event is exactly 0 0.1111 in this example. So that means that the probability that the value is zero is bounded below by this number. Ah, okay, okay. That's not like it's some function, or it should not be. It's it's not a function of a function of uh, the activation probability. It's simply that it's plotted on the same graph. It's not. Uh, it's not a function of the activation probability because. Uh, no, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So if the activation probability is one, then this number is exactly the probability that the value is zero. But if the activation probability is smaller than one, then the probability that the value is zero is higher than the extinction probability. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Example two is a bit different. Uh, the game tree is no longer random. In fact, it's a complete, uh, a complete uh, annary tree. That means that uh, every node has exactly n uh, has exactly n uh, children. In my picture, in my picture, it's a binary tree that's uh, presented. Um, just as before, we assign every node of this binary tree to a player, either one or two, and player one is assigned to a node with probability q. However, here there's something new. So we assign the so-called capacity to a node. And a capacity is just a number between 0 and 1, chosen in this example from a uniform distribution. And again, everything is done independently. So that the capacity is chosen independently across the nodes and of the and the also independently of the choice of the active players. Why do we need capacities? So they determine the payoffs. The payoff to player one is defined as the minimum capacity uh, over the nodes that have been visited during the play. So for example, if this is the sequence of nodes that's being visited in the first three periods of the game, then you can see that the payoff is going to be not, uh, not greater than 0 0.4 because we pass through a node with this capacity of 0 0.4. In, in fact, in, the, in this game that's pictured over here, you can see that the value is not greater than 0 0.4 because if player two chooses 
to go to the upper node here and also here, then no matter what player one does, eventually uh, player one will have to pass through one of the nodes with a capacity of 0 0.4 or less. Now, through this node or through this node or through this node. So that means that the value is, is bounded about by 0 0.4 in this example. Now the question we ask is what is the probability that the value is smaller than 0 0.4 or smaller than 0 0.5 or whatever. Here's the answer. Okay, what do you see? So on the vertical axis, you see the probability that the value is smaller than 0 0.05. Now, 0 0.05 is, is basically a very small number. It's like 5% of the range of the payoffs. The payoffs range from 0 to 1. This is a very modest request that player one makes. Player one wants to know, okay, what's the probability that I get a value of smaller than 0 0.05? And as before, on the horizontal axis, you see player one's activation probability. Um, and you see two lines. Why two? Well, because the blue line corresponds to the binary tree and the red line corresponds to the ternary tree. And just as before, um, both lines are non-increasing for exactly the same reason. Moreover, you see the same phenomenon occurring um, uh, here in this example, namely, we have critical activation probabilities. So let's look at the binary tree. If player one's activation probability falls below 0 0.53, then the value is going to be smaller than 0 0.05 with probability one. And only if the activation probability of player Q is above this threshold is the probability that the value smaller than 0 0.05 positive. So for this reason, we call this number 0 0.53. We call it 0 0.05 critical activation probability. What is also interesting about this example is that if uh, player one's activation probability Q is smaller than one over n, remember n is, is the number of children that the nodes have, then the value is zero almost surely with probability one. And this I find a little bit surprising and interesting because um, remember the capacity is chosen from a uniform distribution between zero and one. So the probability that the capacity is zero is zero. The fact that the value is zero means that player two is able to drive the play through the nodes with a vanishingly small capacity. And that happens if player one controls too few nodes. So uh, this was the presentation of the two examples. And if you have questions then, yeah, I think it's a good time to, uh, for me to take them. Uh, if not. It, even if uh, uh, you know the, the 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 path over the tree were at random, uh, with this model that you are talking about now, you would be looking at the minimum of uh, a set of uh, random variables that are IID uh, with zero one distribution. So I I don't see it as particularly surprising that uh, that minimum is asymptotically zero. Of course, now here you have the, the added uh, strategic uh, uh, element, but. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you, you might be right. Um... Uh, of course, the key is the fact that both players choose uh, the uh, choose the successor nodes. Sure. But the thing is that uh, yeah, if player one doesn't have a lot of choice, then player two is able to kill him almost surely. I think we agree on this, Marco. 
All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, let me then continue uh, with the presentation of the model. And I would like to explain to you how these two examples fit. The primitive object, um, the one from which the model is constructed is what we call a primitive distribution. It's a distribution, distribution of what? It's a distribution of three random variables that we call yota, gamma, and psi, and you map them all. Yota is the active player, gamma is the capacity, and psi is the number of children. And you can take any joint distribution of these three variables you like. So going back to the two examples, how is this primitive distribution chosen in the two examples? Um, let me start with the second one because it's more obvious. Well, uh, the psi, it's the number of children. It's not really random. It's equal to n with prob probability one. Gamma is the capacity. It's uniform on zero one and uh, while well, yota and gamma independent. Now in example one, um, the number of children has a geometric distribution. And what's interesting is this uh, third bullet point, the way we choose gamma, the capacity. So uh, look, the capacity is one as soon as, as, as long as psi is positive. So as long as a, a node has uh, at least one child. And the capacity is zero if the node is childless. Okay. So this is how the capacity is chosen in example one. And this, it produces exactly the payoff function that I that I announced uh, that the pay of the player one is one if the play never ends, if we never enter an end node. Okay, so this is a very nerdy slide because I'm explaining to you what a game is. And of course you all know what a, what, what a perfect information game is, but I have to do this because I've said that we construct a set of games. So a game uh, consists of three elements, uh, game tree, T, the assignment of the active player and the assignment of a capacity to the nodes of the tree. Okay, and this is, this is a game. How a game is played? Well, you've seen how the game is played. The players choose successively uh, the nodes. And if uh, we denote by H not H1, the sequence of nodes successively visited in the course of the game, then the payoff to player one is defined to be the infimum of the capacity uh, of the nodes that have been visited. Any such game has a, has a value. The reason for that, by the way, is that this payoff function is upper semi-continuous uh, and it's bounded, so, so there's a value. This is crucial. Um, this is how the measure on the set of games is being set up. Somewhat informally, I could describe it to you like this. If omega is uh, the set of games that um, that I defined, then one can give in a very natural way a polish uh, topology on omega and define the measure on it in such a way that this, this triples the number of children, the active player and the capacity, this triples are independently distributed across the nodes and each, is, each has the distribution uh, given by the primitive distribution. So these triples are IID across the nodes of the game tree, roughly speaking. Okay. Um, I'm, not I'm not going to guide you through this formal definition, but what I would like to do is to refer uh, to Jacques Neveu because we borrow, essentially we borrow the formalism from his work. Um, from a formal point of view, a game is what probability theorists would call a marked tree. Um, and uh, people doing branching processes will probably recognize this reference. It's kind of standard um, in, in branching processes, I believe. Uh, okay, so uh, that brings me to the main uh, results. 
and in fact we have two and probably i'll be very brief about the first one and uh, i'll elaborate on the second one a bit here's the first uh, main result of the paper remember that v is the value and k is just a real number and we're interested in this quantity, the probability for the value to be smaller than k. We prove that it is the smallest fixed point of the so-called value generating function fk, which I have not defined and maybe I will not. Okay, so uh, this is really the technical um, uh, technical engine of the paper, the CPU of the paper, if you like. Uh, the reason I'm not going to define the value generating function formally is because perhaps when you are buying a computer, you might not be necessarily interested in the CPU. You might be interested in the quality of the screen, of the audio, or uh, the, uh, uh, the quality of the uh, battery or the connectivity, but not necessarily in the CPU. Um, so I'll be paying more attention to the implications of this result. However, I do want to explain to you what this value generating function does in um, somewhat informally. So the, the role of the value generating function in our analysis is a bit similar uh, to the role of the probability generating function in the study of branching processes. And that explains the choice of the name, the VGF, the value generating function. So the value generating function reflects the usual recurs recursions for the value. So what are these recursions? Well, if you look at a, a node and if you want to compute the value of, uh, of the game of this node, then this value can be computed as the minimum of two things, the capacity at the given node and either the largest or the smallest value over the node's children. You take the largest if it's the node controlled by player one, and you take the smallest if it's the node controlled by player two. And this, essentially the value generating function, what it does, it maps uh, the distribution of the value tomorrow to the distribution of the value today. Okay, that's the way it works. Okay, if you are not happy with this hand waving, do tell me so, and I'm gonna click this button then. And that'll take me to a formal definition. But if you're okay with this, then I'd rather tell you more about our second result. Um, okay, so I'm player one and I'm interested in whether or not I have a chance of getting a value of at least K. The probability that the value is at least K, is it zero or is it positive? Now, the theorem tells me that it's zero exactly if these three conditions are satisfied. The first two are kind of trivial, and it's the third one which is really interesting. Now, I'll spend third, maybe one minute telling you why the first two are sort of trivial. Well, um, if the capacity is always at least greater than k, then of course the value is at least greater than k. So it's obvious that condition one is necessary. Uh, condition two is also because if, if this probability uh, were positive, then think about what would happen at the root of the tree. There would be a positive probability that the root of the tree has no children, psi is zero, but a capacity of at least k. Now, if the root of the tree has no children, it's a very simple game that terminates instantly. And the value is, of course, equal to the capacity at the root. So if that capacity is at least k, the value is at least k. So, okay, so condition two is kind of trivial as well. It's the third condition, which is really interesting. Um, so a certain quantity has to be small. And this quantity is a sum of two parts, two terms. The first of which is quite intuitive. Um, we are looking at the expected number of children of a node 
but we only look at nodes that are controlled by player one and have a capacity of at least K. Now, I think it's pretty intuitive that this quantity should be relevant uh, for the question of whether the value is at least K. Uh, it's also natural that uh, the, 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 the higher the expected number of children at such nodes, the more likely it is that this probability is uh, positive. Interesting is the second term, which is the probability that a node has exactly one child, a capacity of at least K, and is controlled by player two. And the reason that we have to add this term is this. Now think about nodes having exactly one child. Now, from a strategic point of view, it doesn't matter who controls these nodes, right? So whether it's player two or player one, there's no strategic choice at such nodes. And so we could also always reassign um, a node controlled by player two with one child to, uh, to player one and nothing would change. And since such nodes are excluded from the first term, because here we only talk about nodes controlled by player one, we have to add um, this event. We have to add this term, basically. So that's a bit of an intuition I have for you for this result. And this brings me to the corollaries to the main results. Um, again, yeah, if I, I have a question, yeah. I've got one question, if I may. About about uh, condition two, so it seems like that's uh, condition one should impose on on each node in the tree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Oops. It is imposed on every node of the tree because remember P is a primitive distribution and um, the capacity and the number of children are drawn from this distribution at every node effectively. This is how the measure works. I took the root just as an example. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thanks. Okay, great. Corollary. So I have a list of four. Um, I, I'm not sure if I have the time to go through all four, but that doesn't matter. Let me guide you through some of them and you'll see what they're about. Uh, the first one is just a small observation, really. Um, it's the fact that um, our second main result encompasses a classical criterion for the extinction of branching processes. Since, since there was a question about this word extinction, let me, let me show you uh, this corollary. Extinction refers simply to this event. Okay? This is the event of the extinction. It's the event that the game tree is finite. It's, it's the extinction. So the extinction occurs with probability one exactly, sorry, exactly if uh, there's a positive probability that a node has no children. And at the same time, uh, the mean number of children is not greater than one. Okay, this is well known, okay, but I just want to point out that uh, this characterization um, is embedded in, into our second main result. Let me talk about critical activation probabilities. I've already pointed out um, this phenomenon when talking about the examples, we've seen it twice. And here it's stated uh, more generally. So, um, okay, um, so we have the following. There exists a number denoted by QC of K with the following property. We'll look again at the event that the value is at least K. And we ask the question, is it positive or is it not? As player one, I'm certainly interested in this kind of question. And the answer is that the probability that the value is at least k is positive if and only if 
player one's activation probability Q is above this number QC of K, which is called a player one's critic K critical activation probability. So in other words, let me reverse this. If player one's activation probability falls below this threshold, QC of K, then the probability that the value is at least K is zero. That is to say the value is smaller than K, almost surely. Now, we can actually compute um, uh, the K critical activation probability, and we have a closed form expression for it. Um, this holds under what I think are very natural and, and mild assumptions. Uh, the formula might look intransparent to you at a first glance, but if you stare at it for a couple of uh, for a couple of minutes, you will realize that actually it's been built from only two blocks. The first block is this over here. It's the expectation of the number of children uh, looking only at those where the capacity is at least k. And the second building block is this probability that a node has exactly one kid and a capacity of at least k. I think Mark, um, I think, um, no, okay. The, 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 there was a question about whether in example one, the critical activation probability is a function of, and yes, indeed it is. I think Marco had this question. So uh, Marco, uh, yes, um, this is uh, uh, player one's critical activation probability in example one as a function of uh, lambda. In example two, by the way, it's particularly it's particularly simple. Um, you can see that the larger is n, it's the number of um, so. We have, in example two, remember we are talking about a complete n-ray tree, and um, the larger is n, um, the smaller is this critical activation probability, which is good news from the point of view of player one. That means that. Um, it's easier and easier for player one is uh, to uh, to get a value of at least k. Okay, so this was my corollary to on the critical activation probability. Well, let me move on to corollary three. which is related to example two. In fact, in much of this picture before when I was talking about example two, you, you already seen this diagram. On the vertical axis, just as before, is the probability that the value is smaller than 0 0.05. And on the horizontal axis is player one activation probability Q. And you've seen two lines, the blue and the red. Uh, the blue one corresponds to the case of a binary tree when n is 2, and the red um, corresponds to the case of the ternary tree when n is 3. And you can see that, uh, yeah, they cross each other. So there's not really a clear comparison, maybe, of what is better for player one. However, things get wonderfully simple when we go to the limit as n goes to infinity. And this black line over here represents the limit as n goes to infinity. So here's the formal statement. Um, don't bother reading this. What this says is the following, which is consider a sequence of models uh, where at step n we have the complete n tree. And what's important is that we generate the rent of the act layer and the capacity always from the same probability distribution. Okay, for all these members of the sequence, I and gamma, the player and the capacity are drawn uh, from the same probability distribution all the time. 
And we can compute the limit of the probability that the value is at least k as n goes to infinity. And in fact, the, the limit is wonderfully simple and, and very intuitive. It's just the probability for player one to be in control of a node and for the capacity of that node to be at least k. Okay, I find this very, very, very natural. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So that brings me. Uh, do interrupt me if you if you have a question, because this brings me to corollary four, and that will probably consume the rest of the time I have, which is great. Um, I didn't even count on getting that far, but I'm really happy to talk about the uh, fourth cor corollary. Um, if I were player one, I would certainly be interested in knowing what happens here. Now I talked to you a lot already about this event, that the value is at least k, but as player one, I might actually be interested in um, knowing the probability that the value is at least k at a node controlled by player one that is controlled by me. And knowing the probability of this event, that the value is at least k at nodes controlled by my opponent, player two. So uh, from player one's point of view, at least, it seems very interesting to look at these conditional probabilities that the value is at least k, conditional. Here, I take the root of the tree as an example. So conditional on the root of the tree being controlled by player i, okay? either player one or player two. OK, what can we say about these? Well, we can say quite a bit, in fact. The first bullet point, I think, is extremely intuitive. Um, basically, what it says is that it's better to be at your own node. The value at player one's nodes is higher than the value at player two's nodes. Now, this statement formally is, of course, probabilistic. It's higher in the sense of the first order stochastic dominance. So the, the distribution of the value of player one's nodes first order stochastically dominates the distribution of the value of player two's nodes. And it just, it just means that beta one is always at least as large as beta two for any k. Okay, I think this is very intuitive, right? So this is what you, you would expect. Also, we know that both these numbers, and now I'm talking about the second bullet point here, are non-increasing, uh, sorry, non-decreasing non in Q. And uh, this is also intuitive, right? The, the, high, the higher the activation probability of player one, the better the value. Again, this statement is probabilistic, uh, formally stated as a first of the stochastic dominance. As Q increases, we get a probability distribution that, that uh, is superior in terms of first of the stochastic dominance. Okay, so we, okay, so we have established that it's better to be at uh, your own node. Now you could ask, how much better is it? Is it a lot better? Is it marginally better? This is a difficult question to answer, but we could say something about this. So let's first look at the two examples. Well, what we can say about uh, the relative benefit of being at your own node is this. Let's look at activation probabilities that are just above a play, uh, just above their, their critical uh, thresholds, their critical levels. So that means uh, let's look at situations when beta is just slightly positive. What is beta? Since I'm talking about example one here, beta is just the probability for player one to win. Okay. So when Q is hovering just above the critical activation probability, we're in a situation when beta, the probability for player one to win 
is positive, but only just, only barely. Okay. So as it turns out in this situation, it's literally a hundred times better to be at your own node. Um, if you look at these numbers, then you will see that uh, the ratio of beta 1 to beta 2 is 100. And this you can take as a proxy of how valuable, how beneficial it is to be at your own node. So the conditional probability for player 1 to have a winning strategy, given that the root of the tree is controlled by player 1, is 100 times higher than if the root of the, tr or if the, root of the tree is controlled by player 2. In example two, it's actually infinitely better to be at your own node. And that's because as Q approaches its critical level, uh, the conditional probability for the value to be at least K at player two's nodes is negligible, okay? Compared to the, pro the, same, the probability of the same event at player one's nodes. So that that's that's quite quite interesting. Okay. This was an illustration of the really final um, part of uh, corollary uh, four. Um, when we look at the ratios of beta one to beta and beta two to beta, we find that first of all, they are non. In, um, well, the first one is not increasing, while the second one not increasing in player one's activation probability, and we can actually compute these ratios uh, or the limits of these ratios as the activation probability converges uh, to its critical uh, to its critical level, and somewhat miraculously. Um, what we see in these two expressions are these same two building blocks we had seen before when talking about uh, the um, critical activation probability. It's these same two building blocks from which the expression for the critical activation probability is built. Okay, The expectation of the number of children at nodes uh, having a capacity of at least k and uh, the probability that a node has exactly uh, one kid uh, and a capacity of at least k. The second expression actually reveals something quite interesting. It basically says that um, the nodes controlled by player two contribute, so to speak, to the event that the values at least K only if they have exactly one child. That is only if player two has no strategic uh, choice at uh, those nodes. All right, uh, so um, uh, Galit, please correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that my time is nearing extinction. Yeah. which means that I would just like to mention that we have two applications um, that I didn't talk about. Um, I'll spend maybe 40 seconds simply telling you what more or less these are about. Let me start with the second one, the avoidance game. So who is avoiding whom? It's player one avoiding player two. In this second application, we consider the following scenario. Suppose player one is forbidden from taking actions that would take her to a node controlled by player, player two, her opponent. Maybe because she's unwilling to take those actions or she's literally unable to. What payoff can she still secure at, um, you know, under this scenario? This is, this is a game which is much harder for her to play. She marginalizes the role of player two. She renders her opponent a dummy. She never concedes a, a, a turn to, to her opponent. It's, it's a much harder game for her to play. So how well does she fare? This is application two. Application one is what we call the conditional game. And the aim of this application is to say something about 
optimal strategies or k optimal strategies of player one. So for example, how many k optimal actions does player one have on average? Okay. Um, how does this number depend on the activation probability of player one? All right, so let me move on to my last slide for today, uh, which, which is certainly the most important uh, slide of this presentation. You may forget everything I said until now, but you should remember this, two things. If one controls too few decision nodes, it might happen that one has no chance of winning the game. So if you want to have a positive chance of winning the game, make sure you control enough decision nodes. There might be a threshold. There might be a phase transition. Be sure to be about the threshold. Now, the second uh, take home message that I have for the decision makers is this. Um, the benefit of being in control of a decision node is the higher, the smaller the probability of winning. It's a little bit like the marginal decrease in returns on controlling a node. Um, the smaller the probability of winning, the larger the benefit of being in control. Well, this concludes my talk. I think my time is up. I would like to thank you all very much for having me. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Arkady. Do people have uh, questions? Well, I have a question. <laughs> um, is it, am I wrong in saying that when the probability of winning is very small, then a lot is about who controls the first node? Mm, this is very interesting. Um, could be, could be. Never thought about it in this way, Galit. Yeah. Um, it's it certainly is the case that um, yeah, if um, if if nodes don't have a lot of children, then of course it's it's important who controls a few initial nodes. Um, now, but you saw if if it, um, if the probability of winning itself is small. Um, yeah, it, it could be, um, it could very much be, yes. Um, so I'll have to think about it. This, this is quite a deep question. I'll have to think about this uh, more carefully before I say anything stupid. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. And more questions? If, if I may, uh, first of all, thank you a lot, Arkady. This was a wonderful talk, very nice topic. Uh, um, in your second model uh, for the binary case, um, you saw that there is not only a phase transition, but there seems to be some sort of cutoff phenomenon. Uh -huh. uh, you know, that probability goes from one all the way down to, to you know, to very small values very fast. Um, is there, I mean, Let me go. yeah, here. Um, if you stay in the class of uh, binary trees, but you change the payer function, uh, do you think, you know, you'd get a similar phenomenon or this is really related to the specific payoffs that you chose? Uh, how would you like to change the payoff functions? The distribution of the capacity? I'm asking you. 
So okay, so what we could do in uh, well, um, if we are to stay in the framework of this model, what we could do is change the distribution of the capacity. In this example, the capacity is chosen from a uniform distribution, but we could change that. And I think, uh, yeah, the 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 picture would would change quite quite a bit depending on, on exactly how you choose the distribution of the of the capacity. Actually, that was my second question. Uh, okay. What is the second question, but not the first? Okay. What if uh, you choose a different distribution that's not necessarily uniform, but has a positive density at zero? like exponential. You think that it would be a big change? Uh, well, yeah, it seems to be, then there's even, you know, even more reason for the value to be zero almost surely, right? If there's an atom at zero. No, 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 the density. The oh. density is positive at zero, so. Ah, uh-huh. Yeah, um, we actually have a, um, a closed form solution uh, okay. for, for the binary tree and also for the ternary tree. And in fact, all I need to do is to plug in the exponential distribution into that expression. Um, but I'm not fast enough uh, to do so on the spot. So I'm certainly going to try this at home. But uh, I think basically, um, you can get any so maybe it's a yeah you oops we can get any shape for this curve we want as long as it's non-decreasing that's my feeling right now by adjusting the density or adjusting more generally the probability distribution of the capacity um so if you like to think about i didn't show you this picture but maybe you would like to think um, of the CDF of the value. So what's plotted here is the cumulative distribution function of the value. So the, 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 the vertical axis is as before, but the horizontal axis is K, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, if I change the distribution of the capacity, then I think I can match more or less any CDF of the, of the, uh, of the value. So something tells me that this is an on to function. Tell, give me the distribution of the value you like. And I think, Marco, I will be able to construct a distribution of the capacity such that, well, uh, we got exactly that distribution of the value you like in this model. Mm -hmm. that, that's, my, that's my feeling right now. The dependence, uh, yeah, in some ways it's quite simple. So for example, if the distribution of the capacity, uh, number one, first order stochastically dominates distribution number two, the same will be true for the value. That's exactly what you can expect. Right? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. All questions are very deep. Any more questions? Okay. Then uh, thank you, Alkari, again. Very nice talk.